uh, and now to a column in National Review that's come up in conversation on our show a number of times this week. The piece is entitled, The American Right Hits Its Hippie Face. And its author, columnist Kevin D. Williamson, joins us now. Also with us is author and host of the public radio program Studio 360. Kurt Anderson, his best-selling book, Evil Geniuses, is out in paperback next month. It's good to have you both on with us this morning. Um, so let's talk yeah. about—go uh, ahead, John. No, no, I was just going to say, by the way, any—, any uh, National Review piece that has the word hippie uh, in its title. Uh, we are required by law to actually put uh, the author of that piece uh, on. So thank God it was Kevin. Uh, but I actually I want to start with uh, with Kurt. And re the Kurt, reason I wanted you to be part of this is I remember in reading Evil Genius as you were talking a lot about uh, the rise of the right and what caused it starting in the 70s. And uh, you talked about uh, you talked about uh, there were like left wing bombings almost weekly. And it would repel people like, for instance, my parents living in the suburbs of Georgia in the late 60s. You're dad, uh, as you've said, in Nebraska. Uh, and now it's crazy. I, I was explaining earlier this week, talking about Kevin's piece, that my parents were lifelong Democrats who became Republicans in the late 60s, in part because of that violence, because of Chicago 68, the, the chaos in the street. Uh, and now here we are 40 years later, and you've got Republicans, former Republicans in the suburbs of Atlanta, voting Democratic, electing two Democratic senators and uh, getting Joe Biden elected president of the United States. Talk about this crazy turn uh, of the left and the right that Kevin writes about. Well, I, I, I like the piece very much and uh, read it earlier this week. It, it is the, it's part of many role reversals that we've seen. And, and really, it was in the book before Evil Geniuses that I published, Fantasyland, in which I talk about many of the same things that Kevin did in this piece in National Review. And, and, and you know, it, it was a long time coming. It's not sudden. And as I say, in Fantasyland, it, you, you had the, the kind of hippie, New Age, anti-reason, anti-science, mysticism, cultism, all of that stuff was obviously rampant uh, in, in the late 60s. You also, at the same time, had a, had a, a certain amount of Protestant Christianity in America going nuts as well, in my view. Um, and, and you had the academic, oh, there is no real, there is no objective reality, there's no empirical reality, science is, is just another ideology. You had all of those things forming this river that here in the in the 90s now the right uh, uh, accepted and and was influenced by much more than the left and the liberals who had abandoned this as Kevin says Dionysian thinking by 1980. So it's 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 you know you live you live long enough as I have and and it it gets <laughs> insane because there's this absolute role yeah. reversal. Yeah, Kevin, it is insane. Like the very things that drove not only my parents, but me, my friends, like, you know, respect for institutions, respect for order, respect uh, for for uh, you name it, go down the line just for, for sort of establishment. And again, the whole idea to conserve civilization. To, uh, um, it's it's all changed, and you write about it brilliantly in this piece. Can you can you explain it to our our, our viewers? Yeah, well, I think you hit on it there, right? When you talk about the attitudes toward authority and institutions, you know, nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, early days of the conservative movement, you have a right that's very much focused on social order, tradition, hierarchy, uh, institutions, and, and and authority, and you have a counterculture which is broadly allied with the political left, but not completely synonymous with it that is engaged in these kind of ritual violations of middle-class norms and uh, this kind of assault upon the you know, bourgeois sensibility. And over the years, you've seen that reverse. And I think that what's really going on here is that progressives since the 1970s, 1980s have been really very successful in their program of building power within the institutions, you know, in media, universities, education more generally, but also in big business places like that. And you have a right that has reacted to that by uh, denigrating these institutions, perceiving them as being enemies. They feel like the cultural norms are being imposed on them by people with values that are alien to theirs. And so they've taken up this very similar kind of uh, theater of making these kind of ritual violations of the expectations of what is now polite society and uh, institutional norms.
Kevin, uh, Kevin? I, I, as I said, I, I like the piece very much, and 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 I I said uh, preach as I uh, as I read it. But do you think that the people on the right, the 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 rabble you're talking about, as opposed to the Mitch McConnells of the world who are not behaving in any countercultural fashion, do they? Is it all about simply a kind of super individualist selfishness, or or is there a actually an ideology involved? Yeah, I don't think it's about individualism at all, and I don't think the counterculture in the '60s and '70s was either. If you you know you look at the hippies, you look at the punks, they all dressed alike, they all listened to the same music, uh, they all had the same <laughs> politics. It was a uh, you know, it was a great deal of conformism. I think it's a lot more to do with tribalism than it has to do with um, with individualism. So that kind of fits into Republican politics in the sense that uh, from the 1950s onward, Republicans were very strongly anti-statist. So you've got people like Newt Gingrich coming into office and making kind of a great joke, I thought, where he said Rome wasn't burned in a day when people were complaining <laughs> about how long it took him to, uh, to get things done. So to that extent, the you know kind of anti-establishment, anti-authority, anti-institutional thinking on the right fits in with a natural part of its politics, but I think it has to do more with a shift in where power actually is located in society. You know, a story I like to tell is uh, of that, the guy who works for that other magazine you were talking to earlier. I went to a uh, seminar of theirs, and it was a bunch of people talking about you know the evils of capitalism and how it was oppressing people and how people who weren't white men you know couldn't uh, achieve any power in society. And it was sponsored by Facebook, Google, Deloitte, and <laughs> Chase Bank, and you know, a few places like that. So you've really seen a change in where cultural power resides, including in areas that are traditionally thought of as being allies of conservatives, like big business, particularly banking and finance, and, and now technology. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very interesting, yeah, Kevin, you talk about how uh, all the hippies dress the same, the punks all dress the same. Uh, my, son's, uh, well, my son's theory is that the most punk song ever uh, was Sweet Home Alabama because it went so far against the tide of attacking Neil Young and everything else. Uh, it, but um, uh, that's just a sidebar. Uh, but uh, <laughs> talk about, though, culture, and I guess that song actually bounces very well to this. Talk about, I mean, I come from the South, I come from Southern Baptist Church, and, and you, you know, we growing up, uh, the late 60s into the 70s, felt constantly under siege, under siege and mocked and ridiculed, whether it was by uh, sneering people on TV news or Hollywood or academics. Uh, I mean, I went to University of Alabama and University of Florida uh, in the 80s, University of Alabama in the age of Reagan. And... No, no, I didn't have a conservative professor in history, political science, and I mean, you name it. I'm, I liked it that way. I mean, it, it actually, I got to challenge a lot, of, a lot of my beliefs, and it was totally fine with me. But talk about, because Kurt was talking about this individualism, I wonder how much of this has to do with them just feeling like they're so under siege and have been under siege for such a long time that this is the only way to strike back. Yeah, well, I think you hit on it with Sweet Home Alabama, which is just kind of, you know, purely reactionary of people responding to uh, criticism and perceived condescension and that sort of thing. So you've got an element of people who feel like they have lost power to which they are entitled. And when people feel like they don't have power, they will take extraordinary steps to seek it out, including, you know, embracing allies that they wouldn't normally uh, excusing things in, in public figures they wouldn't normally excuse. So I think that is really part of what what you know describes and 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 um, explains this you know radical change in expectations mm -hmm. in say the Republican Party about the uh, behavior of public figures, presidential candidates, things like that, about the uh, you know acceptability of, of certain aspects of political discourse and and those sorts of things. Yeah, it seems and, to me and, also. And Kevin Hell, but, but Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Kurt. I was going to say, Kurt, how bizarre is it also though that that this very same people that preached order and talked about you know. Uh, Democrats not uh, respecting institutions are now striking out against institutions, even the flag. How, how much have we heard of uh, like, uh, the, the left disrespects the flag? And here you have uh, certain people on television defending uh, the, 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 the beating and the abusing of police officers with American flags and accusing the cops, accusing the cops of being actors. Well, that, again, that's another one of the role reversals. Imagine if 
what happened on January 6th had indeed been Antifa, had been a left-wing thing. I mean, that was the cartoon caricature of what the socialist revolutionaries of the late 60s were supposed to do, and of course, never did anything of the sort. Um, and and as well, I mean, it goes on and on, and, and, and it's why I, th I thought this piece was so interesting and provocative. I mean, who are the people who trust more than the right Let's say the FBI and the CIA these days. Well, it's liberals. It's people on the left. Um, uh, you know, who are the cultural conservatives, really, who keep their families together uh, and so forth? Uh, again, as Kevin has written about in, in other pieces, it's 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 liberals. It's it's the affluent, successful people who, for a couple of years in the late 60s and early 70s, perhaps, um, had long hair and went to protests and got high. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's wow. it's really a fascinating turn. The piece uh, yeah, yeah. in uh, the National Review is entitled "The American Right Hits Its Hippie Phase." Kevin D. Williamson, thank you. Thank and you, Kevin. We really appreciate it. A great piece, and uh, Kurt, thank you as well. I and and yeah, I think I, I I'd love to read a piece uh, from one of you or both of you in Sweet Home Alabama sometime. <laughs> There's something about driving in a car in 1974 and hearing the line "Watergate does not bother me." Does your conscience bother you? That makes you just stop. Go. What? What do they uh -huh. say? <laughs> so, yeah. Kurt's bestseller, Great Evil City Geniuses, guys. is out in paperback on August 10th. Uh, thank you both for uh, joining us this morning. Let's go.